<sighs> I have been waiting for this one. Season 4 is where we are introduced to two of my favorite Letterkenny side characters. Now I would say who they are, but hey, we'll be meeting them soon enough. Patience. But on we go into the episode. Your gal has a cousin who's fun, and she is no longer your hun. Cause you had to pop him and boy did you drop him, yeah you did what had to be done. You came to after having a bar fight, felt like you got hit by a car, right? But your pal had your back, went on the attack, but it turned off his gal like a nightlight. That God-fearing sack of shit Bradley came in and he fucked up so badly that your brother stepped in, which his gal calls a sin, but I'd do the same fucking gladly. Katie chose me over Jonesy, I don't like that he's all alonesy. But I'm getting laid, I don't hate that trade, I just wish that she had a clonesy. Hoovering bombers and rips, eating zoomers and taking mad dips. There's no end in sight, but I'm on an apt flight, so fuck off with all your guilt trips. The church said no more to my teachings, been filling the void with street preachings. I'm out in the rain and I haven't seen Wayne, us together is not too far reaching. Wayne knocked out Bradley and I'll say, through that bullshit, Rosie won't stay sucks for me because there's no guarantee i'll see either of them at my birthday it's been two months since rosie went packing and sure your love life has been lacking but a friend backs a friend and on that you don't bend she's onwards and upwards get cracking our little letter kenny poets definitely did make one thing clear no matter how much they might like someone the second you hurt or wrong one of them they'll drop you quicker than they picked you up We get a quick run through on what all the characters have been up to since season 3's past events. After we're all caught up, we arrive at Modine's 2 just in time to see a fight break out between the Hicks plus some of the other characters and the Degens. Of course, our boys come out on top. We then move on to the produce stand with Wayne, Squirrely Dan, and Derry as they talk about going to Gail's birthday party at Modine's 2. Wayne says that he has too much chewing to do, but Dan is actually quick to call him out on the real reason why he's keeping himself so busy. As we all probably could have guessed, this is Wayne's way of keeping his mind off of Rosie. But to counter Dan's previous claim, Wayne says, I'll do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Immediately after, we see Riley pull up in the driveway alone for the first time. While the Hicks are throwing insults at him left and right, we get a good look at how uncomfortable he is now. I never really took into account how much Riley and Jonesy relied on each other and piggybacked off of each other's comebacks. Honestly, I kind of felt bad for him. But before things could go any further, Katie calls Riley inside. While Jonesy's working out, we meet one of the most iconic duos of Letterkenny, Ron and Dax. Who brought the rocket, boys? These billet brothers are fucking rocket, boys. Wanna watch me shoot from my point, bud? I got a stick you can handle. No penalty for hair pulling in this game. Check you from behind. Let's play dirty snipe. Let's muck it up. Different kind of headshots over here, bud. Don't need a conky to enter my dark room, rocket. We love stick swinging, boys. How about a quick poke check? Oh, I love a good spear in the slot. Mm. Do you like a long twig or a short twig? I'll show you an illegal curve. Play some skin, Ron. Coming right up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be your buddy. I'll be your buddy. What are we even doing here? Ron and Dax were such a good dynamic to add to the show to help spice things up. Since now Jonesy lost the only person he hung out with, this was a perfect time to bring someone new into the mix. While everyone is sitting at the table, Katie brings up how Stormy still hasn't come out of the barn, most likely because she's depressed that she hasn't seen Rosie's dog Cedo in a while. If you forgot, that was the dog Stormy ended up having her litter of puppies with. Katie proposes that they invite Rosie over to see if she can bring over a Cedo, where then Wayne sternly declines. Hey buddy. Hey buddy. Uh, how you doing buddy? 
Riley and Jonesy awkwardly run into each other at the convenience store and they get to catch up a little bit. They both admit that they've been a little bit down and Riley goes on to say that being with Katie isn't all that it's cracked up to be, seeing how she's always with Wayne and his friends and never with him. This is exactly what I was afraid of happening. There's never been an instance where Katie outwardly showed an interest in being exclusive with just one person. And now that the time has come for her to take on this kind of commitment, it's clear that she's not ready to do so yet. In the middle of Riley and Josie's catching up, Glenn as well as the skids show up. And as we all know, this is a popular place for the skids to dance at. But Glenn comes with the intention of street preaching there. This is where we do rips. Stuart, this is where I do revelations. What are you guys doing? Like we go to the gym and do reps? This is the area for reps. We just want to do reps. Well, we could we could all do revelations. We don't want to do revelations, just reps. One reps? No reps, just reps. What about reps and revelations? Just, just reps. reps. Katie arrives at Modine's where she sees Rosie visiting Gail for her birthday. When Katie mentions that Stormy hasn't been herself, Rosie confirms that Cito hasn't been himself either. Say, what would you do if you never had to work a day in your life? Read. I think I'll go do that now. Happy birthday, cousin. Bye, Katie. Like Wayne, it looks like Rosie is keeping herself busy as well. The only difference is that she's spending most of her time reading instead of touring. Back at the barn, Dan asks Wayne again if he'll consider going to Miguel's birthday party. But again, he says that he has too much touring to do. As Katie arrives, Wayne mentions that he took Stormy to the vet where he was able to confirm that physically she's healthy. To be concise, Wayne says that the vet says, the vet says that she's the healthiest German Shepherd she's ever seen. Which can only mean one thing. Vet says she might be depressed. And then we have Katie telling Wayne like it is. Well then, you and Stormy make a fine pair of poopy pants then. Why well, kite, Katie? The only difference is that Stormy can't talk. I bet if she could talk, then she would tell us what's wrong so we could do something to fix it. You can talk. And it would be wise for you to use that luxury to tell the appropriate parties what's wrong so we can do something to fix it. So I totally understand how hard it is for some people to get over relationships, but I completely agree with Katie here. Two months have gone by since Wayne and Rosie's breakup and Wayne's inability to express how he feels isn't doing anyone any favors. When you're someone like Wayne who throws himself into a large mound of busy work to keep yourself from feeling whatever it is you need to feel, it begins to not only affect you, but the people you're around as well. Again, I feel for Wayne, but I think his biggest flaw that we all can agree on is his inability to find a healthy way to deal with his feelings. Snipper. Who brought the fucking rocket, boys? Who's Billet Brothers a fucking rocket, boys? Let's play a little two-on-one ski. I'll play left, he'll play right, you fill the middle. Ride the pine, we'll change on the fly. Oh. Let's find your neutral zones. Mm -hmm. I'd love to back check you, bud. It's a butt-ending clinic over here, boys. You make my stick high, get it? Come penetrate the slot, let's do it. Need a good D, man? Show you a good D. I like what the writers are doing here. Introducing a different duo from what we're used to with Riley and Jonesy was a perfect move. Having Ron and Dex be Riley and Jonesy's gay polar opposites was a good pace change that didn't offset the mood that we were originally used to only getting from Riley and Jonesy. We get a quick scene of Wayne standing alone with a depressed Stormy before pulling out his phone and giving someone a call. Meanwhile, the skids meet up with Glenn so Stuart can challenge him to a turf war for the parking lot. How are you now? We're well, good and you? Well, then tell that to your face. Rightly so, both of them seem very uncomfortable and reserved seeing and speaking to one another. But they end up making two things very clear. Where they stand, and the only reason why they're meeting. You knocked out my cousin. My loyalty to my family will not be compromised. Your cousin knocked out my friends. My loyalty to them will not be compromised. Good enough. We're here for the dogs. Okay. Pitter patter. Luckily, Bradley gives Rosie a call to ask why she and also Wayne aren't at Gail's party. He goes on to say that everything's been settled and that there shouldn't be any hard feelings after a scrap's been done. After the air is somewhat cleared, we see a little bit of weight being lifted off of both of them. 
Upon seeing Stormy, Zito begins to bark loudly and Stormy finally comes out of the barn. At Modine's, we see everyone having a good time and wishing Gail a happy birthday. But before the episode ends, we get a good old makeup moment. Relationships. It's a lot of work. Do what you love. And you'll never work a day in your life. Riley drops by the farm and before he can even say hi to Katie, she asks if he can go get her some sour candies. Sure, Katie Cat. As soon as he pulls out of the driveway, Mr. and Mrs. McMurray pull in. They let Wayne and the gang know what the coach has been up to on the golf course. Apparently, the coach plans on oiling up some eggs at the Canada Goose's nest, so they won't hatch, therefore lowering the population increase. What? 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 I've never been so irate in my whole fucking life. You don't fuck with Mother Nature. You don't fuck with that cocksucker. You don't fuck with motherhood. To say the least, it's clear they have the highest respect for Canada Gooses. <laughs> and for that reason, they all immediately make their way to the golf course. Hey, hey buddy. Oh, hey buddy. You, uh, throwing some weights around, eh? Yeah, beasting it up. Nice. Muscle confusing. Aggressive overloading. Getting yoked? Getting yoked. Nice. Riley and Josie run into each other at the gym and have a really awkward encounter. But no need to worry, because you know why? Ron and Dex are here to save the day. Who brought the rockets, boys? Whose billet brothers are fucking rockets, boys? I'll celebrate your biscuit all night, bud. Ever gone bar upski? Fag. How'd you know your dad's safer when I fist his ass, bud? We got real dirty with his dangle, bud. I fucked your dad with chapped lips and a runny nose. I fucked your dad with bad breath and B.O. Olympic rules in this shootout, boys. Order of shooters is me, 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 and then me again. I'm fucking T.J. Yoshi. You've never seen a two-way center man with jam like this, boys. Let's see some jam, boys. Let's see you jam it right up there. You need a pest on your roster? I'm a shit disturber. Josie tries to get Riley to hang out with him, but he turns him down, saying that he has to get back to Katie. Thank you. I am very good. Over at the golf course, the coach announces that the goose droppings will no longer be a problem. After a quick round of applause, the Hicks show up to confront the coach and the board about their decision on how to get rid of the Canada Gooses. They then try to come up with a plan on how to keep them off the golf course. Townis will give you 65 bucks a tail for picking them off. But killing coyotes is okay. Coyotes will raid your hen house. Coyotes will attack your livestock too. You don't see no Canada Gooses stealing from nobody, good or bad. You know, you know what Canada Gooses do? Canada Gooses help the people that's being stolen from. That's what Canada Gooses do. Tell you what, if you're accusing Canada Gooses of stealing, you're accusing me of stealing. I suggest you let that one marinate. All right, Jonesy. Glenn, the skids, and a lonely Jonesy all show up at the convenience store. Glenn tries to get him to be his altar boy since he has nothing better to do, and the skids also offer to let him become one of them. As you probably could have guessed, he isn't very excited about either option. Do you enjoy gaming? Yeah. Dancing? Dancing. No. Hard drugs? It's a fight on sight, buddy. Oui, c'est ça, c'est parfait. Pardon? I think you mean pardon. Do you like bread? Yeah. <laughs> That's the body of Christ, buddy. Do you like wine? Sure. That's the blood of Christ. Do you like singing? Um. Do, 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 do. Dude. Oh lord, did you hear it? It's the voice of an angel. I think the choice is clear. Stupid. The Skids and Glenn are both trying to win over Jonesy's loyalty to their respective groups. While this face-off is happening, Riley pulls into the parking lot to get Katie more sour candies and stops by to say hello to Jonesy. Jonesy gives Riley a smart idea to just buy a lot of sour candy and put them all in a jar so Katie will stop sending him to the store to get some. Riley comes back to Katie with a jar of sour candies. But annoyingly enough, Katie points out that she didn't want sour candies, but instead she wanted sour jelly beans. Hesitant about going back out to the store for sour jelly beans, Katie then suggests that maybe Jonesy will be willing to pick some up, if he's not gone yet. Hearing that there's a possibility that Jonesy could be gone provokes Riley into driving back to the store to make up with him. No! No? No. No. I'll go, I'll, I'll go get, I'll go get them.
After badgering the coach for nearly the whole episode, the coach decides to call off the oiling of the eggs if the Hicks finally leave them alone. Once the deal is made, they shake hands and the Hicks finally drive off. Get some ankle socks, you dickhead. Come on, come on, come on. To clean those damn those Canada coats and the don't for you. You fucking ass around here on a price for each fucking night. Go for an Arnold Palmer. What are you doing? What are you doing? I asked you first. Not drinking at 11 a.m. How's that for an answer, you fucking degen? This episode starts with two new natives being seen selling cigarettes to kids outside of Modine's. There's a small confrontation between them and Katie as she calls them out on what they're doing. They end up calling her a skank before Katie walks off, warning them that they're going to be in deep shit. I'll give you a different kind of clap bomb, boys. Four pink pills and she's gone though, I promise. Let's set up in Gretz's office, boys. Work my quiet zone. For the first time, we see Riley and Jonesy officially together since Katie chose Riley to be her boyfriend. They're both working out at the gym and watching over them are Ron and Dax, doing their signature chirping. I have to say, boys, that is some of the finest chirping that I've ever received. Ever? And your shrines, too, your temples, my god. First team all-stars. Sick tap to the temples, boys. Two days written all over you. But people aren't supposed to enjoy being catcalled. Yeah, supposed to not enjoy being catcalled. Yeah, okay, fuck, buddy. If anybody knows how hot we are, you're looking at them. Okay, this friendship that is forming right now is probably the best clash of personalities that we've seen so far in Letterkenny. It's also nice to see Riley and Jonesy have friends outside of themselves. Up until this point, they only had each other plus a little bit of Katie every now and then. To say the least, their relationship with Katie is complicated where it more so leans towards the physical attraction rather than enjoying each other's company. But with Ron and Dax, there's an actual mutual friendship forming. They actually all seem to like being around one another. Their names are Shyla and Shania, the two newest strays on the res. We learned that the two natives Katie encountered earlier are named Shyla and Shania. We also find out that they were able to take Essence Slash away from Tannis. If you remember, they were the two main guys we always saw with Tannis in nearly every scene in a public setting. When first learning about what Shyla and Shania are doing, Wayne isn't very interested in interfering. His mindset changes once he finds out that they call Katie a skank, where he then is immediately on board. Well, and she's bought and paid for. We cruise on in there, eat like king, beat the shit out of those dudes, snatch up Axe and Slash, and away we go. Katie tells Wayne that now might be a good time to call in a favor since Shyla and Shania have so many guys now. And with their near-perfect timing, Riley and Jonesy pull into the driveway where they finally decide to cash in their favor from Season 1, Episode 5, when they had the native flu. The hour is upon us, Bible Thumper. How would you know, heathen? You don't even wear a watch. What happened to he who cast the first stone? A broken window, likely, and hopefully no one seriously injured. The development between the skids and Glenn was definitely something that I didn't expect to last this long. But hey, the turf row for the parking lot continues. And then we come to an interesting turn of events. If your god found himself in a comparable turf war contingency, what would Jesus do? Jesus would advocate for empathy, acceptance, and grace. Jesus might advise you to take a whack at his way alive. Very well, but fuck it. We will sample his style for the day. Oh, under the condition that you sample ours. You're just gonna let this chicken sit uncovered, or? Put the grill up at 500, you wanna turn that down a bit, or? Montreal steak spice and help that bison meat, so you're gonna sprinkle some on there, or? At the cookout, we see the guys backseat cooking tannis and pretty much questioning every grilling decision she makes. It's a complete opposite day for Glenn and the Skids, as the Skids dress like Glenn and Glenn dresses like the Skids. While Glenn is teaching the Skids how to give a sermon and pray, the Skids primarily teach Glenn how to freely dance. Take this, press play, and dance. Hey, Katie. Hey, Katie Cat. Pete and repeat. Hola. Riley and Jonesy ask Katie if she would be okay with dating both of them again since they're partners. Katie then tells them that she actually doesn't want to date either of them. <laughs> to make the two feel better, she does give them an upside. Think of all the snipes. Mm. Big city slams. Mm. 
We'll snipe Sully, boys. Dirty fucking dangles, boys! On the other side of the cookout, Shiloh and Shania are having a tough time grilling. Tennis calls over to Axe and Slash and asks if they still prefer the company of them over her cooking, where we continue to see the growing regret in their face. I'm fatigued, feeble, flimsy. Same. Strange, dilapidated, doddering. I feel strangely fine. Glenn ends up outdancing the skids while not being under the influence of any drugs that they have provided him. Stuart concedes and decides to share the parking lot with Glenn rather than continuing the turf war. Chicken's dry. What? Nothing. No. What did you say? Chicken's dry. You can hardly swallow it. You want it to be a bit moist. Ugh, don't say that word. What word? Oh! Moist! It's finally time to eat and neither Axe nor Slash think Shyla and Shania's cooking is good. Sled, Ted? Two more trucks pull up and a couple of old faces return. Radass, Jive and Pete, and Sled, Ted. As Axe and Slash are about to get into a scrap with the Degens, they run over to Tannis to ask for her forgiveness and assistance. She accepts the two back and then we're gifted a big old scrap. After the scrap, everyone sits back down and eats Tannis' food. What a nice way to end such an intense brawl. Benjamin! Guys, by applause, who agrees with me on this? Women are like cats, and men are like dogs, right? Episode 4 starts with a super cringy comedian from the city doing a show at Modine's. The whole bit was just so awkward to watch. And then we get the plot of the episode. Real place. You think this is easy? Think it's so fucking easy? Why don't you try it yourselves? Squats up, boys. Oh, squats up, tank top. Yeah, looks like you guys could use a bit of a tune up. Riley and Jones are at the gym, and once they see Tyson and Joint Boy, they bring up to them how they aren't in shape. After badgering them for a little bit, we learn that Riley and Jonesy actually work at the gym now and are offering their services as trainers. Like we all could imagine, Tyson and Joint Boy are taken by surprise seeing how they're both bigger and stronger than Riley and Jonesy. What's the matter, you chicken? The lovely Miss McMurray and I have been doing some very serious thinking. Maybe we should try it ourselves. Stand-up comedy? Or something similar? Well, to be fair. Uh, to be fair. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair. To be fair, it's likely pretty tough sledding up there for a stand-up comedian. Mr. and Mrs. McMurray start by the farm to bring up an idea of hosting a talent show. While Katie and Wayne are appointed to be the judges, Dan is excited to give comedy a try. Daryl, on the other hand, is pretty hesitant about the whole thing. Wayne and Kitty bring up how he came from a family of lion dancers, and we also get a very punny backstory about Derry's legendary lion dancing relative, Aunt Doreen. Aunt Doreen could have gone to provincials. Some say she could have gone to regionals. If she had lived in the States, she would have gone to state. Oh, how she'd have won state. She'd have took state. If it hadn't have been for... She didn't have the... If it weren't for the... Bum, bum leg. leg. Burgers disease. Was it burgers? Yes. Burgers. Didn't she get treated at the Mayo Clinic? Yes. She got her burgers treated with mayo. Did she do that to catch up to the competition? Did she catch up? Yes. And despite her burgers, she never beefed with anyone. She relished the challenge. That was a challenge that she relished. 
mustered up the courage. She worked her buns off. She worked the buns off her burgers. No cheesy moves. Let us all be inspired by her. She let us. No hot dogging, just burgers. Wayne and Katie end up calming Derry down enough for him to agree to go through with the talent show. And just in time, Dan comes back from Gales and asks the group who their favorite comedian is, where they all give different answers. Dan tells them that he decided to be an observational comedian. This is the type of comedy where they bring up things that happen in a person's everyday life that the majority can relate to and poke fun at. Welcome, Letterkenny, to the first ever Letterkenny talent show. Round of applause. First up in the talent show is Gail, and it is a little wild. Here to perform a monologue from her favorite movie, Gladiator, it's Gail. <laughs> I do apologize. Uh, this is a monologue from Gladiator XXX. Uh, glad he ate her. Lingus, you barbarian. Let your Italian hands roam all over my body. <clears throat> Unsheath your sword. I implore you. Spear me, you dick. Take Oh. I'm about to cry, Maximus. Oh, oh, oh. Well, that was bang on. Even better than the movie. Thanks. I'm gonna start over. The coach plays ukulele and sings a song dedicated to his wife until someone sneezes, where he's then thrown off and this happens. What, somebody got a life-threatening to sneeze out there? Huh? You finally got some class up here after Gail's little strip sneeze, and then now look what happened! Look at it! God, am I speaking can't to sneeze up here? Do I need to get down on my sneeze and beg? Huh? You take that garbage over sneeze and order yourself to We are called My Treasure Journal. And then my personal favorite performance, Glenn's. For some reason, this is a song that I just randomly started singing for no reason. I mean, just listen to these lyrics. Don't they just resonate with you? I wanna be close to Christ and why, and why. I wanna be close to Christ and why. I was, just, I was just wondering, where exactly do you want Wayne to touch you? Where do I want, where do I want Wayne to touch my spirit? What else would I mean? Don't answer that. And then we have Stewart's thing. What the actual fuck was that, Stuart? Scream therapy juxtaposed against self-expression from the streets. And now, for our second set. Oh, you're a little rascal, aren't you, little uh -oh. girl? Uh-oh, am I in trouble, Santa? Mm -hmm. I've been a really good girl this year. Uh. And the most scarring has to go to the McMurrays with their role play as Santa and Mrs. Claus. Yes, you do. You've been naughty. You have been so naughty, you little girl. You need to step on the face. Grab my jingle balls. What the fuck, Wayne? These costumes weren't cheap. Doing you a favor before you had to get it dry cleaned. You ladies know your angles. If you don't provide people with proof that you're pressing pounds, what's the point? I meant CrossFit training from them. 
I mean, yeah, sure, if you want to start with beginners. You dip your toe in the water before you come in? Yeah. Start soft, makes sense. Those peasants will show you the ropes. Meanwhile at the gym, two girls speak to Riley and Jonesy about getting training. Originally, they thought they wanted CrossFit training from them, but it turns out they wanted training in from Tyson and Joint Boy. That ninja dust! Lineups at the dollar store is getting longer. Like I just stopped in there to get a candy bar the other day. I'm Back at the talent show, it's Squirrely Dan's turn and he's actually killing it. We also get a surprising topic brought back up that I had totally forgotten about. She's ever noticed. Glenn over here is wearing his glasses again. What's the matter over there, Glenn? You got poor eyesight? Dan, I sure do. Last winter, Gail got me LASIK, but it didn't take. So I didn't say it was your fault. I didn't ask you for your life story, Glenn. But it kind of makes a dollar. Don't it? Kind of <laughs> Thank you, everybody. That's my time. It's the small things like this that makes me appreciate the writing of this show. Even though I had completely forgotten that Glenn had gotten LASIK and a complete makeover in season three, the writers did. And they even poke fun at the idea of him simply going back to his normal style after the LASIK didn't stick. But back to the talent show. Let's see how Dan did. Well, it was observational as build. Funny, because it's true, I guess. Overall, not so bad. Thank you, Miss Katie's. I appreciate your assessment. Wayne! Well, well, I liked it because what I see, I understand. Whereas everything else I've seen today, well, I don't understand. I guess that makes you the fellow to beat, Squirrely Dan. <laughs> Squirrely Dan is currently in first place, but who else is actually left to beat him? Well... Even with the badass music in the background, I was still nervous for Derry. Throughout the whole talent show, the camera always cut to him every time an act ended and he did not seem the least bit comfortable. As the music starts for his line dance, we see he's really stiff and that he's psyching himself out. But before things can go too far, this happens. Sometimes I think I'm too soft for this show because I was just so overwhelmed with this scene. I just love how Wayne and the rest of Daryl's friends are able to visibly see that he's in distress and instead of letting him crash and burn while all eyes are on him, they decide to join him. It's nice to see and be reminded that there is more than one way to be there for your friends that doesn't involve physical violence. This scene was such a good way to show us that even in the most humiliating situations, they're always going to be there for one another no matter what. The McMurray's have invited us over for a barbecue this afternoon. That'll be a soft pass for me. Just a soft pass? A super soft pass. Well, why is that? You got something else on the go there, Big Shooter? Nah, nah you know, it's just Saturday. Just Rosie scooch on over, watch a little TV. Bob's your uncle. Do I have to remind you that you are in a long-term relationship? And? Before going into episode 5, we get an interesting development on Wayne's love life. He's trying out a long-distance relationship with Rosie, but the group reminds him that soon he will have to step out of his comfort zone and they can't Netflix and chill every night. To say the least, Wayne is hesitant. You know what? I don't know who called it the comfort zone, but I'm pretty sure they call it that because everything inside that zone's good and comfy. So once you get outside of that zone, fuck. Lots when things can get a bit dicey. The McMurrays invite the Hicks over to their place where Mr. McMurray is in nothing but an open robe and speedos and Mrs. McMurray is in a bikini. Glenn and Gail are also here but they're both already in the hot tub. The McMurrays call for a game of Never Have I Ever and right off the bat, like the true McMurray fashion, the Never Have I Evers are highly intrusive and sexual. Never have I ever felt strong sexual urges towards another spouse, significant other, or sibling. That's very specific. Hey, Wayne, how's your beer? I don't care. Hey, don't. 
Bird's family, can you can bring me over when it's gonna suck this one out of what do you think we plateaued? What are you talking about, buddy? Riley and Josie are both looking at themselves in the mirror where Riley says that they think they've plateaued and he sees no gains being made. Because of this, they both plan on intensifying their workouts in hopes to bring on more gains before the hockey season starts. However, the biggest issue arises is when they decide to kickstart their gains with performance enhancers, but they agree to quit taking them well before the season actually starts. We go back in time a couple of minutes just before Katie takes Khabib out of the hot tub so we can see what Wayne's up to before Katie joins him. We see that Tannis has showed up at the McMurray's place and has a little chat with Wayne as he's having a smoke. So where's this party at? Basement. Don't see your swim trunks. Didn't bring a set? No, I didn't bring a set. Well, inside they'll likely have a set. Good, I'm gonna need that set. They'll get you a set. You know what the McMurray's are up to, right? I have an inkling. All right. I'm gonna go home. I just came here for you, boo. Anna. How's your beer, big brother? I'd have a beer. Once we're all caught up to where Katie took her leave, we're back at the hot tub just in time to see Derry do the same thing once Mrs. McMurray begins to play with his feet. Katie, how's your beer? I'd have a beer. Mm -hmm. I lost another one. Whoopsie daisy. Oh, slippery little buggers. <sighs> oh, she's in the neighborhood. So now Wayne, Katie, and Daria are trying to figure out the best way to leave the party. Guess what? 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 This may very well call for the old Irish goodbye. What's the Irish goodbye? Well, that's when he leaves without saying goodbye to anyone. Also known as the French exit or Houdini. I thought the French exit was when you climax on a gal and you leave without cleaning it up. It's almost not worth thinking about, Derry. Technically, a French exit is when you leave without paying the bill, but in this case, that is not applicable. Guess what? What? This very well may call for the old Turkish takeoff. What's a Turkish takeoff? That's when you pull fire alarm, leave with a stranger. Guess what? 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 This very well may call for the old Tokyo sayonara. What's Tokyo sayonara? Well, that's when you leave, but you only say goodbye to the cat. Maybe this calls for... No! What? what? Maybe this calls for the letter Kenny leave. No. Letter Kenny leave? That's when you steal a 2-4 and walk through a sliding glass door. Well, desperate times. Desperate measures. I don't think we're there just yet, but tomorrow what? Let's continue to monitor the situation. When Scrooge comes outside to check on them, the group tries to hint to him that Mr. and Mrs. McMurray are part of the lifestyle. But Dan ultimately doesn't know what any of them are talking about. After that, the McMurrays join the Hicks outside to propose they play a game called Pass the Banana. Riley and Josie stop by to see the skids in hopes they can provide them with performance enhancers. But after Stuart hands them their steroids and tells them about the side effects, they're seen having second thoughts. However... You guys should be good. Yeah, we should be good. Should be good? Yeah, like, should we good? I wouldn't worry. No. No, it should be good. For sure. If you want my honest opinion, you should be good. Cause like, if you say we're good... You're good! Yeah? You should be good. Feel snipe Sally, boys. Yeah, dirty fucking dangles, boys. Pay the man! All right. With Dan being the only hick left in the hot tub, the McMurrays make their move. After they enlighten him on the origins of the word cuckold, Dan finally understands what the hicks were trying to tell him all this time, and finally decides to take his leave. Huh. Carol, how's your beer? Yeah, I'd have a beer. The skins have another visitor from a girl who's come by for her Ritalin, aka Ritz. But when she's given steroids instead of her regular, the pieces slowly start to come together. You sold the gym rats, Ritz, not Roids, you rep Skellion! I need my Ritz, not Roids! Those were meant to be Ritz, not Roids. And yet here we are, Roids, not Ritz. So if we rip 10 supersets at a rate of 10 every 15 minutes, so How many reps per supersets, buddy? Uh, 20 reps per superset. Make that 30. Done, buddy. Now double it. If we rip 60 reps per superset. Over at the gym, Riley and Josie's minds are racing 100 miles an hour. When they realize that they aren't feeling any physical effects from the performance enhancers that they thought they took, they end up deciding to take even more. Two girls walk over and notice the capsules and tells them that they're taking Ritz, not Roids. Learning this little fact, they decide to work out without the help of drugs. I have a few ground rules I'd like to cover. Pertaining to... Shoot. No open mouth kissing on the mouth. Pardon? Observed. 
No tushy play unless I ask for it. And I will ask for it. What? I'm sorry. Now, once we get started, it is recommended that you do not look me directly in the eye. Play of word. Huh. So now that all the hicks are gone, Gail and Glenn are the only two remaining guests at the McMurray residence. Gail, of course, understands what type of couple the McMurrays are. However, Glenn is just now grasping that they're polyamorous and quickly leaves once he realizes what they're looking for, leaving only Gail to enjoy the rest of the party. Squarely down. Uh-huh. So now do you see what we mean by uh, the lifestyle? Yep. I never thought the McMurray's would be a swinging type. I could have told you that before we got over there, bud. Nobody ever went to thunk it. Kurt, near everyone in town thunk it. Why do you think Rosie stayed home to read? It must be a pretty good book. Sure. But do I know what? It sure is nice to be back in the comfort zone. Hi, Rosie. A little crave and misbehave. Hard yes. And that's why I never drink out of Gino Retta's mug again. These sheets are just jibber. Oh, hi, welcome to Sports Center. At the start of episode 6, we turn to a Sports Center segment where Dan O'Toole mentions how violent the Larry Candy sport teams are. This goes for even the non physical contact sports like curling and cribbage. Toolsy! You think I'm making this crap up? So what are you saying here, Tools? Okay, just if I were Hudson and James Bay... Home that, to do hay. Yeah, yeah. I'd be staying in Europe. Guess who's coming to visit us this weekend? No way. Way. No way. For hay? For hay. No way. All the way. Who'd they say? Well, they didn't, did they? Well, not yet, anyway. So go ahead and say. James and Hudson. Bay? Bay. James and Hudson Bay. No way. Later, Kenny is getting a visitor. James and Hudson Bay. Though we haven't heard of them till now, the Hicks seem more than willing to throw them a welcome home party. They end up naming the event Great Day for Bay. James and Hudson Bay hockey players all the way. Bay? Beautiful. Letter Kenny Shamrock's all time leaders in points, pins, and plus minus. Now they're playing in Europe. Imagine all the Amsterdamsels in Europe. We get closer to figuring out who James and Hudson actually are while Riley and Jones are holding up their player stack cards. It looks like they're pretty good hockey players. Uh, Bay Brothers. Egotistical? Egotisticals. Stuart, they're your family. Questionable. Undeniable. Unverifiable. Stuart, they're your cousins. There's pictures of you and the base together as kids all over your house. My mom's house. Over at the skids, we learn even more information about the Bay Brothers. For starters, Stuart isn't happy about them returning to Letterkenny. And secondly, they're Stuart's cousins. From the pictures that we saw of them from Riley and Jonesy, I would never have guessed that the Bay Brothers were actually related to Stuart. I guess for some reason I assume that any relative of Stuart's would look and act just like him. Kitty meets this hot guy on the rest that helps her load the pig on the back of her truck that they plan on cooking for the party. She asks his name and it's actually Zach Russell Terrier. Turns out he's the Bay Brothers' second cousin. So here's how that piece of the family tree went. Uncle Cal married my Aunt Sue. Oh, which one's a Bay? Aunt Sue was a Bay before she was a Casa. So now she's Sue Casa? Married Calvin Garfield Casa. Goes by Calgary. Hmm. You might know their kids. Sam and Ella. Sam and Ella. Now Sam and Ella have a half-brother, Ty, as well. Ty Casa. I said half-brother. Last name's Food. Ty Food? Present. Jesus. What's your name? Katie. Katie what? Wait. God damn it, just when we thought we were going to learn their last name. You know my half-brother, Ash, right? Ash who? Wednesday. Ash Wednesday. Mm-hmm, that's him. Hangs out with the books. The books. Art and Mac. Art book and Mac book. Yeah. No. Are you fucking with me? No. Zach Russell Terrier and Thai food ain't fucking with you. Tennis comes by to ask what the pig is for, where Katie explains that it's for the barbecue for the Bay Brothers. Tennis proceeds to tell her that there might be a little issue with their scheduling because the natives already had a party planned for them as well, because they're also part native. Their party's name is Thunder Bay. Now, how are they going to solve this? Hey. That's Barley. Okay. How are you now? 
He should stand down on Great Day for Bay. What? The Bay Brothers are coming to the res for Thunder Bay. They're part native all the way. They're full hick all the way. Plus, we already purchased the pig from your people. Yeah, but do you even know how to cook it? Throw it on a spit and rotate. Don't threaten me with a good time. Okay. Here's the scoop. We've already planned the party. Yeah, but we've already spent $1,000 on fireworks. I don't want to see that go up in smoke. Ah. What? What? Nothing. Go ahead. Keeping in mind that you once burnt down the produce stand, a lot has happened since then. The Brothers Bay Home for Hay is the perfect opportunity for all of us to come together and show them we're proud. So, we would like to invite you and your friends here for a great day for Bay. Or you can move your party to the res for Thunder Bay because the Bay Brothers are part native all the way. They're full hick all the way. So? You trying to sneak a sunrise past a rooster, Tannis? I don't know. You're the one stuck between a cock and a hard place. You're breast or thigh guy. Luckily, they end up reaching an agreement and decide to do the party there, and also to change the name from Great Day for Bay to Great Day for Thunder Bay. Throughout this scene, we still see the physical attraction between Wayne and Tannis, though Tannis' feelings is more apparent. She even asks Wayne if Rosie is going to show her face this time and that people are beginning to talk. This prompts Wayne to tell her to... Mind your beeswax, Tannis. Later, Bo. To quell his slowly rising feelings and maybe even a little bit of irritation, Wayne stress drinks what's left of his beer. Riley and Jonesy visit the farm after failing to find the right way to greet the Bay Brothers, where Katie then ends up inviting them to their party. In return for the generosity, Riley and Jonesy offer to help prepare for the party, where Wayne requests that they go find where the Bays live and to help them with the hay, and to also bring some puppers. It's finally time for the party and the turnout is massive. There's one problem though. The bays have yet to show up and Riley and Josie aren't sure where they are. And then the plot thickens. And pyrotechnics this year too. Welcome home, pussies. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Tan. <laughs> What's to say? What were you bays doing all day? We yeah. had a meeting. Meeting? Let's call it a bay of pigs. There's that gym bay. And there's that other gym bay. More like Guantanamo Bay, because I didn't know whether we were going to get out alive. Hey, it's Big City Slams. I felt like I was on Bays of Our Lives, because there's so many storylines going on all at once. Big City Slams too, boys. I don't even know what bay it is. Angie? Never thought I'd be into bay sex. Thanks for the Bay City role, boys. I'll be your bay on say any day. Well. LOL. After it's revealed that the gym babes, the Big City Slams, and also Angie were with the Bay Brothers, they ask if Stuart came, where he then reveals himself. Though Stuart strongly dislikes them, they seem overall pretty cool and even as if they could all finally hang out and just have a beer. It turns out that all this time, Stuart just misread their feelings toward him. Let's have a fucking puppers. I love a fucking puppers. I just always figured you didn't want to. You know, the whole Hicks versus Skids thing. The other hockey players all the way, boys. Part native all the way too, boys. We're family all the way. And then of course we have the season finale heartbreaker to end on. That's off to Tannis, boys. She's certainly a great day for Thunder Bay. Yeah, Tannis has outdone herself. She sure did. So where is Tannis? <laughs> So don't get me wrong, Tannis and Wayne have a good chemistry and they're both strong leaders. I love them both, but man, this just made me sad. It's bound to happen given their past, but I just wish it didn't have to. Put simply, Wayne craves physical connection. With Rosie gone, he doesn't know what to do with himself. 
Even up to this point, I fully believe that Wayne is still emotionally invested in Rosie, but with her not being around for the physical side that he also craves, he finds himself gravitating towards Tannis. This seemed like a pretty chill season up till the end. Almost like they were giving us a break before some really crazy shit happens next season. I wouldn't go as far as to say that this was my favorite season, but the new introduction of Ron and Dax definitely did bring new comedic aspects to the show that will definitely mix up things in future seasons. Moving on though, I'm insanely excited to revisit season 5. To not get too ahead of myself, I'll just say a lot of crazy shit happens that I'm excited to dive into. Well, I guess I better get started. See you guys in the next one.